folks, this episode of Australian Car Collector is something really, really special. Uh, I'm in an inner city, well, an outer city suburb of Brisbane. I'm, I'm sitting here with Matt, uh, and we have the most wonderful vehicle beside us. Now, I'm going to let Matt introduce to you the, the car very shortly. But uh, basically, if you know the name MG, forget about the Chinese things that you'll see running around at the moment uh, that uh, are very, very popular. I'm sure they're great cars. But we're talking about MG from, from yesteryear, from where the, the whole MG nameplate first started. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a British car. Um, the Chinese simply bought the name. And what you're looking at here is termed old number one. So I'm going to let Matt take the story of this and fill you in a little bit about what he's discovered as he's gone through his journey with this particular motor car. Matt, um, I know for a fact that you've done an enormous amount of work on this vehicle already and mm -hmm. there's a lot to go, but tell us the story of, of where it came from. Matt. Okay, so the first thing is this is a replica of old number okay. one. Yep. <laughs> so not old number one, old sure. number one's in the museum in England. Yep. Um, so. Basically, I've wanted to build it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on a Morris Cowley chassis. Okay. And um, in 2017, a 24 Cowley came up, which is the correct chassis right. um, that Kimber used to build the car. So uh, Kimber being the... Uh, Cecil Kimber, the founder of MG, yeah, essentially right. the father of MG. Um, so he built the car, uh, started in 24 for the Land's End trial in 1925. Right. And when he did the Land's End trial in that car, he won a gold medal. It, it, he met all the requirements. That, you know, he did well. Um, the car was custom built from his experience from the previous year in, in the Land's End trial. Right. So basically, it's got a lot of features on it that were specifically made for the Land's End trial. Okay. So he changed the configuration of the brakes. He, he put the swept arches in over the, over the wheels. Um, most importantly, he got hold of a Hotchkiss engine, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is quite rare, especially even at the time it was a quite a rare thing, um, which obviously gave the car a lot more power. Sure. So because Cowleys were a side valve engine, Hotchkiss is an overhead valve engine. Right. Okay. So so it was the the sporty version of what existed there, but it's, it's a much, it, it was that. a trial version of the car. So right. for for trialing. So he was really getting into unknown territory. Yes. At that stage. Yeah. So he wanted to build sportier looking cars. Mm -hmm. So he basically was modifying Morris's like the normal Morris Cowleys and Oxfords into a sportier version, which was MG. And, and proving it on the racetrack. Basically. Very much. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. As, as so much of the early years of the, the automotive engineering came about was, was on the racetrack itself. Yeah. So Matt, tell me more about how the, the acquisition of this all came about and, and how it landed in, in this country. For the engine? Yeah. Yep. yep. The, um, we ended up finding a, a fuel tank that was a, a, a rare fuel tank mm -hmm. uh, that turned out to be an X race uh, on any um, MG NE fuel tank. Okay. Um, I put it up on Facebook in one of the groups to ask if anyone knew what car it was from. At the time, I didn't know it was an N type. I, I basically was looking for what model MG. We knew it was an early car. Right. It was a 1930s style fuel tank and it was original. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out later that not only did we identify what it was from, what car, but the actual car. Um, and it turned out that that car was in Europe and it was being restored at the, at the moment and that the owner would have liked to have the, the tank. Right. So the person who identified it and we started talking, um, he was in England and asked me what cars I had and I told him and amongst that I said I'm building a replica. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time the intention was to take the Morris side valve engine with 3D image a conversion head for it. We were going to go out to make an overhead valve engine um, we were discussing that and then he said to me i know where the second engine is and uh, so at the time we've heard stories like that before and but yeah. this guy has a, a a very good provenance so it was my ears pricked up and said, okay. well, show me yeah sure. and so he, sure enough i get a photo of the engine sitting in a sort of a very dark corner right and um, the discussion for price popped up it wasn't his engine so he was basically helping me make the deal sure um we struck the deal and um got it for a very reasonable price and uh that was 
late last year. So it took about six months right. from striking the deal and getting it here. To get it here. Yeah. Okay. So. And so have you been able to sort of, well, okay, let me rephrase it. What have you been able to do to try and verify the, the authenticity of, of the, the motor itself? There's, we can't do a lot document-wise because there just isn't. Mm -hmm. any documentation that we can we can jump on right. the owner of the car oh sorry the owner of the engine um is from a prominent family that is very well um associated with the mg factory back in the day right um and still today so or like in the mg world um the provenance absolutely is there right. for where it's from so there is no doubt whatsoever that that in this engine came from the abingdon factory mm -hmm. um the story is that it was purchased sometime in the early 1960s, and it was it was um, it's been basically sitting in their warehouse or their shed ever since. Wow. So when we got it, so we knew that, and so that wasn't there was no question that it came from the Abingdon factory. Okay. Um, when we were bringing it over because of Australia's asbestos rules, I had to get anything that possibly was asbestos taken out of that. So we worked on the head gasket. Right. take the sump gasket out. Sure. So we, we ended up doing that. And then I got this series of photos saying, you need to see this engine. It's new. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's a 1921 built engine, Okay. but it's brand new. Right. It hasn't been, it hasn't been driven. It has been modified, but it hasn't been driven. So what's your assumption then as to what may have happened? There? So the mod the modifications that we know have been done is the ports albeit have surface rust on them now, they've definitely been polished. They are very clean. Um, the valves are sitting quite flat. The mm -hmm. valves have definitely been machined down. Right. Um, so that's been done as well. So that is one thing that they know Kimber did to old number one's engine. Right. That is a definite. Okay. Um, Kimber, the car itself, uh, I believe it's a 1547cc, mm -hmm. but he entered it in the under 1500cc, I think so. The question came up was he cheating or you know did he did he enter it wrong um he did write uh, i think to one of the motor magazines back in the day explaining that no he reduced the cc of the car but never explained how right okay. so there is there has always been the assumption that it was done no one knew how it was done what we found with this when we pulled the sump off uh although the engine is new somebody has changed the pistons and conduits. Right. So everything points to yes. this motor was prepared for yeah. racing yes. in, with the same specifications. As as old number ones. And so it so, really points to maybe there was the whole yes. thing was there was a second motor put aside, which ready to, to go. Reason. Which stands <laughs> to reason. I mean, most, most race teams do yeah. that. And yeah. Why not back then? So the argument has been that there's been no information about that, that mm -hmm. nobody knows about that. My my version of that is, or my take on that is, you don't often hear about the spare parts of competition cars. No, of course not. People don't talk about that. So it's quite conceivable that that's, it is, that's the way. That there was a second engine. Yeah, and sure. back then, because of why he built the car, he built the car to show what MGs could do. Of course. Um, it would have been laps of him not to not to make to put some guarantees in place that that car was yeah. going to be able to perform. Yep. Um, so why wouldn't he? So um, either way, you're going to end up with a very, very special yes. replica with what we believe to be uh, a genuine uh, Cecil-inspired motor. We can't, uh, we, we can't play claim to that. Mm -hmm. However, what we have got is we will have the only replica out there that has the actual correct engine in it. Right. In the correct model. Well, that's, that's one of pretty, one of twenty built, as far as we know. That's a pretty good claim to fame. To yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So oh, look, I, I think you're like a bloodhound, mate. I think you've just, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've just kept digging and digging and digging. Yes. And uh, what more can anyone ask? Yeah. Well done. No All right. Thank you. Good stuff. Yep. So, how did you come across this <laughs> configuration, man? Was it something you just decided? Well, I'm going to set out to build this thing. Yeah. Or? So when. In in seventeen, when we got the, the chassis, there was there was a, there's other replicas out there, mm -hmm. um, varying degrees of accuracy. Right. Most of them at the time, I think all of them at the time were painted red, which is not correct. Mm -hmm. The car now is red, but that was done later. That was done when it was restored in the uh, post war. Okay. So the original car was uh, basically flat grey. It was undercoat grey, 
and I wanted to build that. I didn't want to build the 1950s plus version. I wanted to build the 1925 version. Right. So that's where the research started. So, And yeah, I believe you've, you've been to the museum and painstakingly yeah. measured every single thing. Pretty much every that, yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah, in 2018, we spent hours on, on the car going over every bit. The museum was awesome. They, were, they let us do anything. Their, their only thing was don't unbolt anything. Fair enough. So they, they let us crawl in and out of it, lift everything up, go crawl under it, you know, That's much fantastic. to the dismay of a lot of the customers that were, look, <laughs> patrons that were walking in because they were getting upset they couldn't take photos because yeah. we were all over the car. Nothing to see here, move yeah. along. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how many trips in total now, back and forth? Only, only one for us, but... Previously, uh, the manager of one of our th the shops that we own, mm -hmm. um, he went um, in 17 and then our mechanic at the time went in 18 and then we went again in later in 18. Oh. So oh. three trips, thousand odd photos, of, of a full folder of measurements and Crikey. everything we can get. So more importantly, it's the bits on the car. There's a lot of parts on the car that are from other cars okay. that we had to find and source. Right. We, we've identified nearly everything. Um, okay. So you've got a materials list. You know yeah. what it is that you need. Yeah. And now it's just yeah. a matter of, is it all found now, do you think? Or? There is a, a handful of things that we can't find. A uh, handful of, either we can't find them because they're so rare we can't get them. Right. Or they were made especially for the car, so we're having to manufacture so them. So either way, you've got a hand yeah. bracket. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. So what we're doing is, like, for example, with the engine, the whole front water inlet assembly is missing. Right. We're not going to find one because they're, they're, it's, they'll be impossible. They're, they're not around. Yep. Um, so we're basically having it 3D printed and then we're going to get it cast. Modern tech. Modern tech. Building. So, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Like, I know what it's like. Look, I've got a 75 Buick and it's hard enough to find parts in yeah. this country for that, let alone... An MG from the 1920s. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a huge amount of dedication. So from here into the future, is there a timeline as to how long you hope this is going to take? Yeah, well, we, we put a pause on it in 2019. We did the variety bash. So we put a pause on the car and mm -hmm. then we were supposed to get back into it in 2020 and then the world changed. Yeah. So we it all got put on hold completely. We didn't do anything with it at all. Right. And we wanted to finish it for 20... The original idea was finished for 2025, actually take it to England and do the Land's End trial. Oh, so do the centennial, expensive. but COVID put an yeah. end to that. Yeah. Um, it's going to be too expensive to do, so we're not. So we, we started looking at it again so, so now what the, the aim is now, we're not going to get to the trial, but we, the original car was registered in, on the 27th of March, 1925. Mm -hmm. So our, our aim and goal now is to register this on the 27th of March next year. 100 years later. Exactly. What, so, a, what a wonderful thing. Yeah. 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 So. Well, mate, it's, it's an extraordinary passion. Um, I, I think your dedication is uh, exemplary yes, it's just uh, so. and we really look forward to seeing this <laughs> in in the metal and, and seeing it out yeah, there yeah um thank you so much for That's right. for bringing us along not a problem and uh, we'll have a look over it no worries and folks if you you see old number one out on the road at some stage um or at some of the shows in the future um all british car days and that sort of thing yep. um this is where it all started so well yeah. done no, thank you thank you thank you very much thank you. No worries. So, if you've got a car, if you're 
friend, family member, whoever it is who's got a car that you'd love to see featured on the show, then right down the bottom of the screen here is where you're going to find a link to it. <laughs>